This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Hello, I'm Diomide Spinellis, editor of the IEEE Software Tools of the Trade column, interviewing Markus Welter, a freelance software consultant and coach, specializing on model-oriented software development, domain-specific languages, and product line engineering. According to the profile on his website, he's the author of many books, patterns, and articles, but what he doesn't mention is the breadth of cutting-edge software he's developed. So, Markus Welter, welcome to the 200th episode of <laughs> Software Engineering Radio. Hello, glad to be here. It's a great pleasure to have you here as a Software Engineering Radio's founder yeah. for this very special episode. What do you mean with the breadth of, breadth of software I have developed? <laughs> <laughs> I mostly do prototypes and do consulting. There isn't a lot of software that I actually wrote that's still in use, which is sad. Mm -hmm. It is indeed uh, a problem with software that we write something we think it will last for eternity right. and then three years after we go back to the client yep. and we know that this has been superseded by something else. I, I, what struck me was that it covered many diverse areas from yep. automation to embedded software to various other yep. things. Would you perhaps please uh, introduce yourself, sharing your background and interests with our listeners? Well, I mean, you, you summarized it. So um, about uh, 15 years ago, I finished um, studying technical physics. So I'm, I'm an engineer and um, I specialized in robot stuff kind of it wasn't very practical and i've always done software back in the day i mostly did database client software for a hospital for example uh, to do um, you know data management of which doctor performed which things on which patients and then after i finished my studies i was i started as an independent um, kind of contractor at the time and I focused mostly on enterprise software, middleware, Corba, things like that, JEE, when it came up. And um, that's also when I got in touch uh, with the patterns community. Jutta Eckstein was uh, the, the path through which I got through the Europlop, uh, to the Europlop community, spent a few years there. I mean, went to the conferences for a few years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, after a while, I uh, kind of moved from... Um, this enterprise stuff to everything related to modeling. I started with UML-based stuff and then code generation. I was involved in the open architectureware framework generator tool thing, which moved to Eclipse. And so I uh, became quite involved with the Xtext uh, tool, which I never developed myself. Some people think that. I just was one of the uh, early users and I was consulting a lot for it. And so that's when I was introduced to textual modeling, also known as domain-specific languages. And essentially, that's where I've stuck since then. Um, I've used DSLs in many different domains, as you say, um, enterprise systems, uh, also financial systems. And the last few years, I've spent mostly in embedded systems where we are building a set of languages uh, based on C, essentially language extensions of C, for embedded software development. And that is not based on Xtext, that is based on MPS, another language workbench um, supplied open source by JetBrains. And so the last few years I've mostly worked on designing and building and implementing languages, uh, collaborative languages that work together, um, together with C um, to develop embedded software. So that's kind of a short story. And my spare time, I fly gliders and do podcasts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> quite uh, many, as uh, we know. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, uh, it struck me, you mentioned that you worked with domain-specific languages for embedded products and also financial applications. And uh, this is, uh, funnily enough, areas that I've also applied domain-specific languages, and I find this fascinating. Why do you think these specific areas and maybe other areas where domain-specific languages are particularly useful or pertinent? 
Yeah, so I mean, the question is, I mean, I could I could reformulate the question by saying, I mean, why would you use DSLs in the first place? And what are the mm -hmm. benefits of using DSLs? And then you can kind of from that, you can deduce which, which domains are useful or are good, are suitable. And I think... DSLs can be used for a number of things. One is simply automation, right? You you write a little bit of code and then generate a lot of code. So you, you, you don't have to type as much. That is the initial motivation most people have because it's kind of obvious. You have to write less and so you, you don't have to work as much. So that's cool. But uh, when you spend more time with DSLs, you notice that there are other benefits that are maybe more important because, for example, a well-designed DSL allows you to capture the the structures and the behaviors and all the intricacies of a domain formally because a language definition is a capture of a domain's structures and behaviors. So a DSL, defining the DSL itself is even a way of understanding a domain. And when you do that, it acts as a communications vehicle between the various stakeholders, non-programmers, domain experts, and software people. So it can be a, 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 an integration backbone and, or, or a way of um, tying down what it really is that, that defines a domain. And finally, if you have a well-defined language, <clears throat> you can often do interesting analyses. So even if you don't generate a lot of code, um, you may still be able to prove the correctness or analyze, for example, through model checking, whether a certain specification expressed in some DSL has a certain has certain properties, and that that's a benefit as well. So, from that, um, it's quite obvious that DSLs only work in domains where you either are highly repetitive, so it's worth creating a language which then allows you to write a little bit of code from which you generate a lot of similar code, right? That's essentially the product line space or the space where you have a lot of bad frameworks that you have to use so you can generate the annoying code to satisfy the frameworks. But I other was domain, about to mention that. Yes, JEE was a good candidate for that in the early days, right? Um, many code generators started by from simple, let's say, entity models generating all the JEE or J2EE, as it was called then, infrastructure, deployment descriptors, classes, interfaces, all this crap you had to do at the time. Um, but other domains, for example, the embedded software domain, um, for example, we represent uh, state machines first class as state machines and not as switch case statements. It's not necessarily a lot less code you have to write, but the code is much more semantically related to the domain and you can do model checking. You cannot easily do that on the code unless you do code level model checking, but that's kind of a different story. And in this financial domain, for example, the DSL was used as a way of, well, <laughs> there was this guy, Herman, uh, who, ret who was 63 and he retired. He, he would retire in three years or in two years. And so the insurance was um, quite pressed to capture his expert knowledge into something that other people can use. And that was a language definition and, and a DSL around it. So that was another, another use case. So domains need to be structured. I, I hate to use the word formal because then people associate Greek letters. Um, Nothing against Greek letters, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> Formal, provable theory stuff. But the language, the domain needs to be structurable enough so that it's useful to have a kind of structured language to represent them. So this checking property that you mentioned, which uh, I can also relate to, is a case of less is more. You have a smaller language, sometimes radically smaller language, in which you can express very few things. And this is useful because you can do actual checking that is pertinent to that uh, domain. Could you give us some uh, examples? And uh, uh, it's a bit uh, counterintuitive that uh, a smaller language is uh, better than a large general purpose language in this uh, area yeah um well um i, I i'm not sh i mean i i agree to what you say but i'm not sure i would call it a, a a small language what i would say is that the the concepts relevant for the analyses you want to run are represented in that language first class right if you look at lisp for example there are not a lot of concepts that lisp has it has things like lisps uh, lists function calls, and stuff like that. And whenever you want to do anything that's more complicated, you compose that from these uh, low-level abstractions. That means that anything that's interesting to a domain 
is made from these atomic building blocks. And if you look at a program, if an analysis tool look at if an analysis tool looks at the program, it has to kind of reverse engineer the domain semantics from the constructs that people build using these low-level elementary language abstractions. If you contrast that, for example, with a language that lets you directly write down state machines with abstractions like state, um, transition, event, guard condition, then you can very easily map that to existing algorithms for model checking that give you certain guarantees about how the state machine behaves. So it's really about representing things first class. Now, the problem is really if you have many different concepts in a domain and you want to represent all of them first class, then you get a really big language with a lot of keywords and that's usually extremely ugly. It's not very flexible, it's not very composable, it's very rigid. And so that's where the size of the language comes in. If you can manage to separate uh, the overall structure of a domain into several small languages where each of them represents a certain aspect of the domain with first-class concepts, thereby making it analyzable in whatever way is useful to that aspect of the domain, and you can then compose these languages to design or describe the overall system, then you win. And that is the goal. Um, let me give you another, a very simple example of how, where this what sometimes people call declarativeness, this first-class nature of um, representing domain abstractions comes in. Imagine you have a, a very simple uh, component architecture DSL. So you have concepts like com component, interface, and port, where uh, components use ports to provide or require interfaces. So you could have a, pro a server component which provides some database interface through some port and a client component that requires that same interface to talk to that database. Now, if you take two components and compose them, then a client component connects to a server component through these ports. Assume some of one of these ports on the client side is optional. So for every given component instance, it may be connected or it may not be connected. To write safe code, Whenever you invoke an operation on that port, you first have to check whether it is connected, right? Like, if port P is connected, then call some method on P. Otherwise, don't do anything, because if it's not connected, you, can call an, you cannot call an operation. Now, what you want is that when you write code in your program that talks to that port, and you do not enclose it in one of these checks, like if is connected, then you want to get an error message directly in the IDE statically. And this analysis is not so simple if you have a general purpose language because you can surely map it into an if, but of course the if can do anything. It can say if port P is connected or true, right? It can do anything. So analyzing or and, and then guaranteeing that really the this, this if around the port call really does what you want, guard against calls on non-connected ports, is really tough. Now, if you have a DSL where you can do things like the following, you can say, if in an if statement, in the condition of an if statement, you use this is connected expression, it cannot be with anything else. So either is connected is the only thing in the if, or it's not there. Then, making this analysis is really simple because then for every call on a port you just check whether somewhere around it there is an if statement that has an is connected to that port. Trivial! One-liner! But you can only do that because you control the language design. And that that's kind of the key. Make those things that are important to your domain first class, restrict the language as you suggested, make it smaller in that sense, and then you really, many of the analyses are not as complicated as they seem in the beginning in a general purpose language. Right, and and you mentioned uh, Lisp uh, before, which is a very restricted uh, language in one sense. So, going back to your example from your domain-specific language book, what if you restricted that uh, a subset of Lisp where you could only use specific functions that had to do with that uh, domain, and then you analyzed that uh, Lisp project? How would uh, that uh, suit the way you are thinking about DSL design? So first of all, I should say that I'm not a, not a Lisp expert and I always mm -hmm. used Lisp as the example for a kind of small language with composable features and whenever I say mm -hmm. something, some Lisp expert tells me I'm wrong. 
So <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. Okay, that makes two of us. So <laughs> okay. Don't be afraid. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very fruitful discussion of between two people who both don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so um, I would say if you if you actually could do that, if you define the bunch of Lisp functions and you would statically know what these are, and you could tie certain analyses to the names of these functions, then you you would get the same effect. However. In a typical Lisp IDE, you cannot do that, right? I mean, Lisp has more stuff, and you cannot easily restrict things. Also, um, you would rely on the names of these functions, because then the names would carry the semantics of what they imply. Exactly. And and that is usually a bad idea. You don't want to have analyses that rely on names. But again, if, if, I, if I use your example where you would somehow, maybe through some kind of tool, actually really limit the names you can use... You could argue, well, then the names are controlled and you can only use these 10 and then I guess it's almost like a language concept. But I think that that's really misusing Lisp. You just, you know, use a language workbench to build a real DSL if you want to do that. Right. And which brings us to the idea of uh, language uh, workbenches. Can you elaborate on that? Many of our listeners uh, maybe are hearing the concept for the first time, so it would be nice to give them an idea of what you mean by that and what it, how it helps us to develop domain-specific languages. Yes. So, I mean, very generally, a, dom- a language workbench is a, a tool or a framework or whatever you want to call it that helps you build languages. That's essentially it. I mean, the term was introduced by Martin Fowler in, I think, 2004, and he had a, a bunch of a criteria what a language workbench um, you know, is, and he had things like it uses a schema to define the language structure, it uses projectional editing to define the notation, it allows to persist incomplete or contradictory information, uh, and so on. Um, And um, so he, at the time when he wrote that, he was inspired by two very specific tools. One was in the Intentional Domain Workbench, at the time called the Intentional Programming System, uh, Charles Simoni's company. Simoni, right. Yeah. And also JetBrains MPS. And and that's when he uh, was inspired to write this. Um, in the meantime, um, there are other... And, 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 and both of these tools actually use projectional editing, and I'll come back to that in a second. However, in the meantime, other language engineering tools have evolved that use parsers and that don't strictly comply to what Martin Fowler uh, said at the time. I talked to him in the meantime a number of times and I think he agrees that um, it's probably a good idea or it would be a good idea to to, to loosen that definition a little bit uh, to probably say something like a language workbench is a tool or framework that lets you efficiently develop languages and not just one language but sets of languages that collaborate that somehow interact where for example one language extends another one or where you can compose existing languages. And What's important when you when you say that is that, um, t- t- from my perspective, two things. First of all, language definition isn't just about syntax, right? What parsers do. It's also about type systems. It's about transformations to other languages, about maybe uh, IDE support, debuggers, uh, groupware, version control integration, refactoring, data flow analysis. There is a whole range of things things or aspects that you can uh, that are involved when defining a language so language workbenches should help you with all of these and also I think language workbenches should allow you to build arbitrary languages uh, they should allow you to build languages that you would typically call a modeling language so it's kind of high level declarative maybe even graphical and also they should allow you to do what's typically called programming languages so textual and maybe fewer abstractions but highly combinable and all of these languages should be buildable or you know you should be able to build these different very different kinds of languages with the same language workbench that's the the real the end goal and there are different tools that are more or less at that point you promised you would talk about projectional editing oh, yes. so right. I'm, uh... <laughs> so um, typically when we when we when we write code right then what we do is we type characters into a text buffer. Literally. I mean, we do that through fancy IDEs, perhaps. Some people still use VI, whatever, or Notepad. But essentially, we're typing characters. And that 
sequence of characters is inherently unstructured. Sure, I mean, every character has a unique ID. I mean, is it an A or an I or an O or a 1? So there's the ASCII codes or Unicode codes, but the sequence is fundamentally, at the beginning, it's undefined. It's just a sequence, a random sequence. And then you have a parser, which takes a grammar, uh, where a grammar is a definition of valid sequences of characters. It's a little bit more involved, but fundamentally. And then right. the parser checks whether your sequence you've entered corresponds, co corresponds to the sequence or to the allowed sequences defined by the grammar of which you claim to write a program or a sentence. And then if, 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 if your sequence matches, then the parser usually builds a tree representation of that sequential set of characters and sure it tokenizes things and it recognizes keywords. So it builds this abstract syntax tree, which is a tree-like representation of the structure that you have expressed through your character sequences. That's how we know how this stuff works. Now, a projectional editor works differently. It works by the following principle. Whenever you change anything to the program, like for example, you, if you from you know, if you have the program that says one plus two and you make it one plus two plus three, then whenever you type the plus before the plus three, then everything you type directly changes the tree representation of the program. And what you see is only a projection or visualization or rendering of the program. So there is no parser, there is no grammar, there is no detection of valid sequences and then construction of trees. Um, you directly change the tree. It's like a graphical editor, right? If you're, if you're in a UML tool and you create a new class on your canvas, then you drag and drop a class from the palette to the, to the canvas. And it's not that the tool draws a rectangle and then there is a pixel parser that constructs the tree that the act of drag and dropping the class creates the object on the tree in the representation of the model and then it's rendered graphically or in other ways. And projectional editors generalize that approach to arbitrary notations. Text, tables, mathematical symbols, you know, fraction bars, stuff like that, and graphics. And um, personally, I think this is a great idea and um, we can certainly de debate the, the benefits and, and drawbacks. Let's do that. Uh, if I understand correctly, a projectional editor only allows you to ed co enter correct program sequences because you edit a valid tree. Sometimes I find myself uh, working by pasting some random arbitrary text into the editor that I've copy-pasted from the web or something and then transforming it through regular expressions or editor commands into a program body. And uh, this is not uh, something that seldom happens because we often search for code snippets on the web or some particular data that we want to incorporate in our program as a dictionary or a table. And it's a generally useful feature. How does this happen in a projectional editor? Well, first of all, you, you did you did directly hit one of the disadvantages. <laughs> um, so um, that, that clearly isn't quite as simple. But let's make a few assumptions. Make Let's make the assumption that the language you work in uh, is a language that also exists in the parsed world, like Java or C or something, right? And that's quite likely because if you want to find code written in some language on the web, as you just said, then it's likely that historically that language has been used in a parsed environment and there are parsers and, you know, that is valid. So imagine, let's make it concrete, right? You use Java in MPS. MPS is one of these projectional language workbenches and it comes with Java. If you paste... Uh, a snippet of Java code that you that you copied from the from the web into MPS, then MPS actually parses that on the fly and builds the tree. So it works as you would expect. Mm -hmm. However, if you said, let's say, um, you pasted um, some Java code or you copied some Java code from the web that contained a bunch of Java, but also let's say a bunch of su bunch of pseudo code, you know, where the you know, person said, you know, and here you do something like this and that. Yes, or line numbers. Yes, or line numbers, right, yes. exactly. Then you would run into a problem. You would have to sanitize that first. And so that is that is, that is a disadvantage. And um, yeah, so, right. But there are many benefits also. And so it's a trade-off uh, whether you want to, what you want to do. So the idea is perhaps you use another editor to sanitize it into valid Java and then you paste it into your... For example. 
workbench. Yes. yes. Is and there a specific instance uh, of a language uh, workbench uh, that you would consider a representative example, a golden standard, somewhere where people should look into if they want to begin experimenting with that? Yes. I mean, clearly JetBrains MPS, it's open source. It's it's really good in terms of editor usability because that has traditionally been a problem because some of these uh, projectional editors, they were very flexible but also extremely annoying in the way you would you have to use them. Like if you entered 1 plus 3, you would first have to enter the plus and then put the 1 on the left and the 3 on the right. And nobody wants to do that. And MPS has gone a long way of making editing as text-like as possible. Not completely, but we've mm -hmm. just recently run a, a survey with about 20 users. Uh, they use different languages, but all in MPS. And while we haven't completely uh, uh, evaluated the survey in detail, what we saw so far is that most said, in the beginning, it's a bit strange, but um, after a few hours or days, depending on the risk of the person, they said it's it's perfectly valid, it perfectly works, and... Um, it, the, the, the point is nobody so the point is that nobody says um, um, you know projectional editors are exactly like text editors when typing they are a bit different but the point is they're not worse they're different and you can get used to it and also you get a lot of benefits right you can use notations that you cannot have in parsed environments like for example tables or fraction bars and that's interesting for dsls because sometimes your dsl should be used by domain experts who have a mathematical background and for them it's more important to have a nice notation than you know being able to type 150 characters per second which sometimes is what some programmers judge their pro you know productivity by so um, it it really depends on what you do it's also that projectional editors support unlimited language composition, essentially. Um, you can easily combine independently developed languages. Now, some parsers and some grammar classes can also do that to some extent, but only to some extent, and the extent depends on the tool. Um, projectional tools don't have that limitation. So it's a trade-off between notations, flexibility, um, and your expectation that you want to continue editing code by typing character sequences like you know for the next hundred years what you did like the last 10 years right <laughs> you know i uh, i always think that if we would reinvent programming today like starting from scratch without any history then we wouldn't limit ourselves to a s linear sequences of characters i mean I, I completely understand that there is all this existing infrastructure and and existing code bases and all of that and so any other approach needs to have an answer of how to integrate with a textual world but if we would start from scratch we wouldn't do it with this linear editing thing and so i think projectional editing is really very interesting for for certain domains not for everything right and uh you, you've mentioned you wrote uh, DSL for a state machine. I've done that. Uh, probably we've both also written DSLs for uh, user interfaces. And I wonder whether such uh, workbenches come also together with some standard library that would avoid having everyone writing their own little DSL for a state machine or a user interface or something like that, whether yeah. we are beginning to have something like that or whether we expect something like that to happen. So that's a very interesting question. Because um, libraries are nice, but um, few libraries, or let's put it differently, libraries are useful if they are configurable and composable with other libraries, right? If, if you would say there is, a, let's say, some, whatever, complex number library for C, right? But if you use that library, you cannot use any other library because you cannot combine them, then the benefit of reuse would essentially be completely gone, right? Exactly. So traditionally, if you look at Antler, the, the parser generator, it has a whole bunch of language grammars lying around. And you can, of course, download that grammar and get started parsing C code or parsing whatever other code. Or there's, I'm sure there is a bunch of grammars for state machine languages. But it's very likely two things. One, you won't want to use this language exactly in the way it was pre-developed. You may want to change it a little bit. And two, you maybe want to use that language in some greater context together with other languages. And that's where this language composition comes in. And so if you are able to, let's say, grab a language module, you know, like a library, and 
extend that a little bit by adding two or three new keywords in some way, but then also use that language or programs written in that language with programs written in another language in some combined way, then reuse becomes interesting. And so I think historically there have not been that many languages in the way you would like it in a library to get it from somewhere because it's not that useful. You would hack it anyway, you would download it, change it destructively and then, you know, no updates would be feasible and so on. But with, with modern language workbenches where you have this language composition or composability and extensibility, this becomes much more uh, useful. And so, for example, um, over the last uh, pff, almost three years, um, a bunch of colleagues and myself, we have built this thing called Embedder and it's a set of uh, extensions to C for embedded software development. And for example, it has a state machine language. It's actually that language is an extension of C that provides first class for state machines, a first class support for state machines. We have other extensions for physical units or for software components and interfaces or even for specifying requirements or writing software documentation. And now the point is that if you write a program and you include that reusable state machine language, you can use it together with the reusable units language and with the reusable software components language, for example. And you can also change that language non-invasively. You could, for example, add new kinds of states or new kinds of transitions. We talked yesterday with a colleague about the ability to add timeout transitions, right? You could add these without ch 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 actually breaking the definition of the original language. You could get them as a binary plugin and you could still extend them that way. And, and then, when you import a new version of uh, the library, you can still continue to use your own. Exactly, un un unless the library was changed in an incompatible way. Of course. Of course, yes. right? But but the, 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 the extensions are modular. And really, that makes interesting the notion of language modules that you can download and use. And so, while what we've built is not like general purpose, because it's all based on C, because that was our goal, um, and better is an example of a set of, currently it's about, well, it depends a little bit on how you count, let's say 30... Uh, extensions to see some of them big some of them small and you can reuse them for your purposes but then still adapt these languages you know plus minus 10 degrees or 20 to make them really fit your environment and you can create completely new extensions of c that are specific to your domain and so these things start creeping up because now we have this meaningful ability or way to reuse and adapt well, 30 domain-specific languages is uh, quite a substantial amount. It's uh, larger than the first uh, uh, the library that came with the first versions of the C programming language. So it's nothing to it's something that you can actually brag about. Yeah. And, and what you described before this copy-paste uh, thing uh, way of reusing domain-specific languages is certainly not the way to work. But I interrupted you. you were about to say something. I, I forgot what I want to say. But um, for example, what we've built is the following. If you take, um, let's say, if you if you copy one of these state machine things, uh, a state machine that you wrote in Embedder MPS, if you take that and paste that to a text editor, you it's it's pasted as text. And you cannot easily get it back into another MPS because we have actually not built parcels for all of these things because, well, we <laughs> can discuss why. Um, but you can also paste that, when you copy it, you can paste it as XML. And then you can send around that XML and that XML is a representation of the abstract syntax tree and that you can paste into another MPS instance. So we do have the ability to, let's say, transport program fragments through text environments, but we don't do it with a concrete syntax, but we use an abstract representation. And so that works for us. That's not a restriction. We copy-paste images and we don't expect some text to be underlined. Yeah. We have a different representation and it works fine for the purposes of that domain of image uh, yeah. editing. Yeah. Uh, let me ask about, you mentioned language uh, collaboration, and I'm wondering what happens when there are concepts in one language that are not expressed in the other. There are so many uh, concepts that in some languages like C are esoteric, like exceptions or closures. Yep. So what happens then when you try to assign or move such values from one language to the other? So let's um, distinguish different kinds or different ways <clears throat> of how languages can cooperate or collaborate or can be composed. Um, the simplest way that 
has been used for a long time is what I like to call referencing. So you write a program in language A and you write another program in language B and language B contains some symbol which implicitly references something in program A. Right? I mean, the classical case is you have an, a JSP page which contains declarations of buttons and they have a given name and then in the Java class that backs that JSP uh, page you have essentially re you redeclare um, Java classes that correspond to these uh, page contents and then you can interact with these things and so essentially by name and type these things are connected. Right. So in that case, what you said doesn't really apply, right? Because it's completely different languages that have well-defined, if you will, interfaces. And expectations. Yes. And that's exactly, that's a good point. Because in my example, language B was developed with knowledge of language A. So they have mm -hmm. been developed together and they can be made to collaborate. Okay. There is another uh, composition scheme that I like to call extension. And in extension... What I just said is still true. A language extension, if you have an extension of some other language, then the extension has been built specifically to extend some base language A. For example, uh, or I should, I should have said C, because that's what we did, right? We have a bunch of extensions to C. So, for example, our state machine language directly uses uh, C expressions in guard conditions. And so, since the person who built the state machine language already knows C, he can build the statement machine language in a way so that all meaningful C concepts that make sense for state machines can be used there, like expressions in guard conditions and statements in actions. That's how we did it. The, the interesting situation is really when you do what I like to call language embedding, where you have two languages that have been developed completely independently and you still want to use them together. And the, the canonical example that people like to use is, let's say you have Java as your general purpose programming language, and then you have SQL to query your database. And now you want to embed a SQL select statement in Java, and not as a string, because that would be cheating. I mean, you would really compose the two languages so that when in places where you have, um, let's say, Java expressions, you can use a select statement, now that's a little bit of a strange terminology here, to, rep to, to get a value. Like a select statement can essentially give you a tuple of uh, values from your database and you then, can, for example, can assign that tuple of values to an array or a struct or something like that in your host programming language. And here, the problem is, you, 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 the, the two languages, um, SQL and Java, they have been developed independently, so nobody could have thought about how to integrate that into the other language and how to make sense of potentially incompatible language concepts. And so in that case, the solution is uh, to essentially have a third language that um, orchestrates the collaboration between the other two. So for example, you could have a language SQL in Java, which has a, which has a Java expression which contains an SQL statement. It would be responsible for uh, doing the mapping of types it would know that if you uh, let's say if your select statement returns uh, three strings then then that then you can map that to a string array of three elements or maybe to a class with three fields or something and it would also that adapter language would also know how to map the semantics in other words um, your code generator that for example then maps your SQL to Java would know that it would wrap that SQL statement into a string pass it through a JDBC API and then take a result set and somehow map that to the to the Java expression on the left side of the assignment so that's kind of the general approach that chimes with uh, my experience there is no royal way you actually have to think when you do such things it cannot happen automatically no but you know, see the, the important th well one of the important things is the following when you combine independent languages and you do that with let's say mainstream parcel technology there is a high likelihood or probability that the combined grammar isn't even parsable and you have to come up with all kinds of escape symbols and all kinds of things so right. one for one one precondition to make this composition work you still have to think in terms of types and semantics, but 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 one precondition is that you can compose at least the, the, the syntax. And that's where modern parser-based systems like the STF parser from uh, University of Delft and Amsterdam um, or generalized 
parsers or projection editors come in. They 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 are they don't just give up and say, well, pff, ambiguous. Let's stop here. They can deal with. Uh, a wide vari variety details depending on the tool of composed grammars. Mm -hmm. and, and there are languages like uh, Scala that actually are designed in this way that allow you to embed a DSL within well, your programming defined. Where I, where, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, surely there are languages that um have syntax so let's 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 make let's step one step back what i talked about so far exclusively maybe except that lisp example you came up with um are what's called external dsls where your languages are kind of defined through another language engineering system the language workbench so there is a set of formalized formalisms to define languages there are also internal dsls or embedded dsls where a language like Scala or Groovy or Ruby or maybe Lisp uh, already comes with facilities to define DSL-ish things that can then be used in the programs expressed in that host language. And mm -hmm. Scala is one of the examples that can do that to a, to, to a relatively large degree uh, relative, I mean, compared to other statically typed general purpose program la programming languages. It's not that great de a degree compared to, let's say, language workbench approaches. Um, so if you say, know you program Scala, and you know that there is a little, uh, a little language that you need to embed, for example, to deal with OSGI services, and you don't want to do that with API calls and frameworks, you can tweak and enhance the Scala syntax to a degree to create something that looks like an embedded DSL. And the same is true for Ruby or Groovy. But you usually don't get IDE support, you don't get type system checks statically because your IDE and your type system, your compiler don't know much about your extensions, all meta programming. Um, in Scala, you can work with compiler plugins to remedy some of that, but your IDE still doesn't know about anything about that. And so what language workbenches give you is that they give you, if you will, holistic extension that, that includes type systems, transformations, IDEs, refactorings, and all of that. And I really like to draw a relatively strict boundary between using meta programming in dynamically typed or even statically typed languages to create internal DSLs and kind of full-blown language engineering that language workbenches let you do. That's why in your book, I presume you focus on external DSLs? Yes. And because you consider this approach superior to... Well, in th th there are two reasons for that. First of all, I've always done external DSLs. I'm just not the person to write about internal DSLs. I mean, I can explain them to the degree that I did now. And I've, I've built a, a bunch of Hello World examples, but I'm really not an expert in that. So I wouldn't write a book about it. But I do think that for many of the cases where you do... You know, we talked about why you would want DSLs. It was about analyzability, stakeholder integration, uh, you know, better IDE support. And you don't get these things from internal DSLs. Yes, you get uh, shortened syntax and some stakeholder integration, but it's very hard to imagine to have an internal DSL, let's say, for insurance uh, rule definition in embedded in Groovy or Scala, and you then give that an insurance guy who is not a programmer, right? You will still get a Java a Ruby file or Scala file. Yes, and Ruby and Scala and Java error messages, which is one of the major problems. And, you know, no first-class analyses. So, in my opinion, many of the reasons why you would want DSLs naturally lead to using external DSLs because you get more benefits. Now, of course, there is a big disadvantage. You have to buy into one of these language workbenches. And so if you just have a little extension to a host language, it's much more pragmatic to just build an internal DSL. And most of these internal DSLs are actually, quote, little extensions to host languages. And that's perfectly fine. It's just not what I've been working on. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move one step uh, back. When I hand code, I've written in a general purpose language to other developers. They just need to understand my code and they can readily apply their experience in that language to the code. But when I hand them code that I've written in a domain-specific language, they also have to learn both the domain-specific language and understand the code. Yep. Aren't those situations drag on productivity? How do you feel about it when someone, or even you, go and look at the DSL that you've written 10 years ago, and maybe it was uh, interesting at the time, but now you have to relearn it to understand what's going on? 
Yeah, that is um, a trade-off you have to make. But there are a few things you should consider. First of all, um, if you replace the word DSL with framework, you run into several, some of the same problems, right? If, if you've built a sophisticated framework uh, years ago and now you want to understand code that uses that framework, you have the same problem. If you want to teach people to use a framework, you still have the same problem of teaching the people the abstractions behind the framework, how they work uh, and how to use the framework. So um, I think the problem really is always communicating uh, the concepts behind whatever it is, frameworks or, or languages. And um, I would argue that languages are easier to learn for the following reason. They are they're more rigidly defined, the IDE can give you more support, you get DSL level error messages if something goes wrong. If you use a framework in the wrong way, you get a compiler error or runtime exception. exception. Yes. So, uh, so assuming the person who you try to teach it to understands the domain for which you wrote your DSL or framework, then I would say teaching a DSL is simpler, especially if you use notations for your language, for your DSL, that are already close to what the people have worked with so far. Um, and you can't do that with frameworks. If the people don't yet know the domain, well, then the question is, why should they use a domain-specific language for that domain, right? If they're not in that domain, why would they use it? Same for a framework. And so in that case, you would first have to teach these people the, the, the relevant domain, the concepts. And I would argue that doing that with a well-defined language is easier. Now, there is a risk that when you define a language, that you make it unnecessarily different from maybe other languages these people already know. That's a bad practice. So just because you can define weird syntax, you shouldn't do that. So if you build language extensions for C, then you should use C expressions and C statement style wherever possible to not have unnecessary uh, learn efforts. And especially if people work in a curly braced world, then it's probably reasonable that they expect your extensions of that curly braced world to also be curly braced. So just don't make stupid mistakes. But then I think... There isn't a big. There is not, it's certainly not harder to teach or learn a DSL compared to a framework. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned uh, notation, which is uh, interesting because you you then find people like uh, who wrote things like the send mail configuration file format, which is <laughs> is hideous. Yeah. So it was successful for its purpose, but it's a nightmare. How do you avoid the situation of having something that's clearly unmaintainable? Well, so first of all, I think we should distinguish two scenarios, or let's say many languages distinguish between learnability, so the, 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 the ability to pick the language up for a newbie, and um, the ability to be productive and write code quickly and, and efficiently once you've learned it. And many of these classical Unix configuration languages probably um, are biased towards the, pro the, 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 pro the, the productivity and not towards learnability. So that's maybe one thing you could observe. And many DSLs are also targeted to experts in a certain domain and you expect that these experts use these DSLs daily. So you could say that it's okay to define a language that's a bit harder to learn because it's awkward, but then once you've learned it, you're extremely productive. I mean, languages like um, APL are prime examples of that. Now, th sometimes the problem really is that um, domain experts use DSLs only rarely, like they configure a new mail server every three years, or they create a new, new insurance plan only every four months or every four weeks. And in that case, they never really become uh, you know, routined using the language. And then it's much more important that, because they kind of essentially learn it every time they, they start up the program, the IDE. And so in that case, learnability is much, much more important. And so maybe it takes them a little bit longer to write the program, but since they forget everything until they do it next time, it must be easy to learn. So I think that's a, a trade-off you have to make when you design a language. Um, and you have to know what your users are like, how they work with a tool. And that's really important. It's also important to distinguish between what's usually called writability and readability. Um, is it easy to write? Uh, so you have to 
you know, few keystrokes essentially. Um, and um, th th is it still easy to read? And there are scenarios where one person writes a program, but 10 other people have to read it. Well, in that case, readability is really important. If you do Perl, where you, uh, where one person typically writes a script, runs it uh, for a day or two, and then throws it away, I mean, maybe simplifying a bit, then readability is irrelevant because you don't ever read it again, except when you write it. So That's how it's been described as a write-only language. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, so, so, so you have to know these constraints or these, 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 you know, environment conditions, and then you have to define your language appropriately. There is interesting things you can do. For example, in projectional editors, the same language can have different notations, and you can, for example, in our case, you can project a state machine as a table. Uh, as text and very soon also as graphics and then different stakeholders can make different decisions and edit the same thing different 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 ways and for example the textual notation is much more writable but the tabular notation for certain kinds of things is much more readable because it gives you uh, a grid of events and states and so you can easily do completeness checks so some kinds of tools let you postpone that decision because you can change it afterwards but that's a kind of special case so, in your experience, how important is in practice the ability to involve the domain expert? Do you actually see domain experts who are not programmers writing code or more reading domain-specific language code, or they just expect someone else, a programmer, to do it? Let's put it this way. Traditionally, um, DSLs have been used in technical domains where in some cases the domain experts were the programmers. Like for example, if I have an architecture DSL for JEE applications, then it's probably going to be used, the language is going to be used by the same person who writes the JEE code. So it's not really an involvement of actual domain experts. But um, this is changing. For example, we've built a language for, um, for configuring refrigerator control cooling algorithms. And there, the thermodynamics person, the physicist that dealt with these control algorithms or cooling algorithms was, was actually involved in writing these programs and also in designing the language. Also in this financial case, this guy Herman, who would retire, he was involved in defining the right abstractions that go into the language. And then the users were actual insurance I don't know how you call them, clerks is probably the wrong word, people who create and maintain insurance plans. And we're actually now building yet another language in the insurance domain that uh, has the same kind of users. So yes, uh, these kinds of domain experts, non-programmers, they are involved. And sure, maybe in the beginning they need some help, so they start reading some of these programs and more programmer types write them. But, you know... Many of these people will start recognizing patterns and getting what you do. And uh, they like to be able, you know, they like to be in charge. They like to be able to change the, you know, insurance plans without, you know, calling up the programmer and asking them whether they kindly have time to help them. And that's a strong motivation to learn these DSLs. And if you build them involving the stakeholders in the first place, you can build languages that will be used by, by non-programmers. And I've seen it and I've done it. It's not necessarily the simplest and default case, but they do exist. And it's hugely intellectually satisfying when you get to the point where you can have a non-developer go and write. It means I think you have succeeded in your DSL design. Yes. And I mean, it, I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, the way we develop software these days is completely ridiculous. That domain people take Word or Excel, write down unchecked, imprecise, inconsistent things. And that's not because they're idiots. That's because they don't have a tool that checks for the consistency, right? And then, and then they print that or send you a whatever PDF and then a programmer types these things into low-level code. I mean, it's completely obvious to me that some aspects of programs, the business logic, should be directly specified, programmed, checked, and tested by the domain people. To me, that's so totally obvious. And so we're moving in that direction, and that's great. So, given the right tools, of course. So is designing a domain-specific language a skill that can be acquired, or is it a, do you require some type of talent? Yes, you have to you be think? born a language designer. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course it can be learned, like anything else. I mean, I, I, let's put it this way. 
that you have to be somebody who is able to generalize, to abstract a bit, to to see patterns and 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 then make those patterns first class. So I'm not talking about programming these language workbenches. I mean, these are just tools that you can learn like any other tool. But thinking in in languages, in 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 um, in, in in abstractions, in meta stuff, that. That's a skill you have to practice. And there are certainly people who are more example-oriented and think more in concrete terms and, um, and um, you know, and other people who are more generalizing, who, who think, let's say, you know, in, in, in classes, in general classes or, you know, instead of saying, imagine you have a turbine with five blades, they already start, you know, imagine you have a turbine with N blades and M blades in the second phase and N plus M is great. Well, you know what I mean? So, so I guess it's good. It's if abstraction. Abstraction, uh, things like that. So I guess if you're a good programmer, if you, if you are good at, for example, also implementing frameworks, because frameworks are also about, you know, writing code for a whole domain or class of problems then you can easily acquire the skills of language design. You still need to practice the tools and you still need to, um, you know, make a bunch of mistakes in the beginning. Everybody did that or does that, but I don't think it's rocket science. Not rocket science. Is there anything else you would like to relate to us because we're moving toward the close of this interview? Well, I guess um, I should point out two things. First of all, if you're interested in that stuff, you actually should pick up my book. Uh, it is actually a free PDF download, so you can easily pick it up. You can also buy a paper copy, then it's 25 bucks or something. And also, um, I do think that the, em the embedder stuff that we've built over the last few years, even if you're not interested in embedded software development, it's a nice case study of what modern language workbenches can do. So, um, I usually, I often demo it at conferences and it's, it's a great demo because it's 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 impressive what you can do so um, even if you're not an embedded person check it out read some of the papers to get an overview of what modern language workbenches can do and then pick up a language workbench like MPS or Spoofox or Xtext or Rascal or MetaEdit if you want to do graphical stuff and, and try it out these things these tools have become quite sophisticated and quite productive Marcus Felter, thank you very much for your participation. It's been a pleasure having you here. Well, thanks for having me on, quote, my, unquote, <laughs> SE Radio. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To support us, you can advertise SE Radio by clicking the Dig, Reddit, Delicious, or Slash dot buttons on the site, or by talking about us on Facebook, Twitter, or your own blog. If you have feedback specific to an episode, please use the commenting feature on the site so that other listeners can respond to your comments as well. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks again for your support.